Hi everyone. <coughs> Welcome to the talk of today, which is what will be given by Shitja Kelkan. I'm sorry, the visual translate. So she's uh, visiting since last week and she'll be staying here until uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, so she, she actually came to work with me on something related to what she's going to present today. So Shitija uh, got the, her PhD at the University of Nottingham in 2016 uh, with a thesis on the relation between environment, galactic structure, uh, evolution, and, um, and star formation at uh, low and uh, higher redshift. Uh, and then she got uh, a postdoc at, uh, at, at the Raman Research Institute in India, and she is currently in uh, Valparaiso in Chile uh, for another postdoc, and I think she hopes to stay there for a little bit more. Uh, so she speaks some Spanish, so if the students got any question, I think they can simply ask uh, in Spanish. Uh, the questions are, are welcome, and maybe she can do by English. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so All one of you can help me. Yes, of Very course. Nice. Okay, um, so hi everyone, I'm Chikita and uh, as you can see the really nice thing, I'm going to start in Chile and uh, most of my work since PhD has always been about something related to galaxy evolution in high density environments. In PhD I work on uh, uh, the evolution of quantitative galaxy structure and star formation in intermediate redshift clusters and now I am working in low redshift clusters, but in a slightly different area. So today I'll be talking about uh, what I like to call as galaxy post-processing in major cluster mergers. Um, <clears throat> so um, this ups, uh, I've been working on several different projects, but I chose uh, this um, uh, uh, this particular theme today because. Uh, after coming here, we have kind of gotten some interesting results and we hope that we get some more interesting results. Um, so, uh, I will just, I, I use the keyboard, right? Yes. Right. So, whenever we talk about galaxy environment, what do we exactly mean? It could be the immediate local environment, which we can characterize in terms of the uh, density, or it could be the global environment, which could be related to the large scale structure of our galaxies. So here in this pretty image that everyone knows, uh, I, I have kind of uh, annotated it to, uh, to lay out the idea of the stereotypical or the classical image that we have of a galaxy cluster. So we have a central galaxy, which we call the BCG. Then we have the info legions, and those wiggly little things that I have drawn are uh, representing filaments. And the way, the, the reason for this kind of interpretation is that we live in a hierarchical universe. So last scale structure grows over time. But the way it grows is through accretion of galaxies in the form of filaments, so basically streams of galaxies enter into clusters or smaller structures in falling into bigger structures and that's how galaxy clusters grow over time. And it's been well documented that uh, this is how a very high redshift protocluster evolves to a present day massive cluster. But <clears throat> There are two things I have mentioned here, which is kind of pearls of wisdom that I realized after working in galaxy evolution, is that galaxies are most commonly found in group environments, even if you may think that most of the galaxies exist in field or non-dense environment. And the other thing is a perfectly dynamically relaxed cluster is a rarity. So whatever perfect picture I have shown here, in in actual, a galaxy cluster is never that simple to interpret and to study. Is there any dynamically relaxed cluster? Is there any? 
at least one? No. Well, I mean, yes, we can, but we can't say for sure, right? And that's that's uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, I'm working on evolving environments. You have to I click first in there. Yes. Click on there. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. I think I will just stick with this. Yes. So uh, this is what I would like to call as the cumulative environment. So uh, whenever we talk and think about galaxies in high density environment, obviously it, because uh, because the galaxies are residing in. Uh, 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 under several different influences, like uh, because galaxy clusters are uh, dense, so they will have a lot of gas, they will have a lot of hot gas, they will also have a higher density of galaxies as compared to outside the clusters. So all of this affects galaxies a lot. And you all must have uh, read or heard about uh, the influence of high density environment on star formation of galaxies, or several different properties, but really what we are dealing here is the cumulative effect of environment. So basically it depends at what stage are you observing your galaxies, especially at what stage of what dynamical stage of the host cluster. So this is kind of like a flow chart of uh, what kind of uh, environmental effects that we should be considering and we should be taking into account. So Pre-processing in the filaments and group acquisition. So, because the galaxies don't just fall directly into clusters, they get fed through group accretion or filament. We have several studies that have shown that uh, galaxies do get uh, processed or their star formation and well structure. I'm not so sure, but especially the star formation being affected. So the galaxies have already started changing before they enter the clusters. And then once they enter the cluster, they undergo further change. And then, because a cluster is never static through the ages, it changes, it evolves, it grows. So that dynamical environment changes the galaxies further. And this is what my, uh, the work or the results that I am presenting today will show. Right, so um, just to give a brief uh, introduction or some sort of an overview about several different effects um, uh, that we observe on galaxies in high density environment. So talking about pre-processing in filaments, um, it is documented that clusters repeat at least 50% of the galaxies through informing groups or informing structures. Um, all the uh, uh, all the observations about the results that I have presented here um, are pretty new because it's only now in the past couple of years that we have made real progress in studying galaxies and filaments because now we are able to do uh, vast surveys exploring uh, cluster outskirts with uh, with a really large spatial coverage. So we have now started to really understand the filament environment of galaxies. Um, in some recent results, we also know, uh, we have also found that galaxies near filaments are massive, they're already redder, and they have reduced star formation. And there have been some contradictory results where exactly opposite is observed, where star formation is enhanced, and galaxies show a higher, uh, I don't know, well, concentration higher content of neutral hydrogen gas which is basically the fuel for star formation but one of the most important caveats is whenever we talk about filament environment is that the flow and the direction of galaxy uh, filament is very important so how the filament is feeding into the cluster is one thing that is uh, likely to determine how the galaxy in that filament will get affected these are, so especially the last one is something that we have understood through simulations. There are lots and lots of studies now that are trying to observationally uh, study this. 
And this is kind of like the classic slide, although I'm presenting it in a bit of a non-classic way. Uh, so cluster environment, effect on galaxy properties. No, no, soon that will take care of that. Oh. Sorry, what's... Hey, don't no worry. Okay. People like this. Okay. So, galaxy evolution in clusters is, is one topic that we, if we want, we can spend days discussing. We can look at each and every different uh, properties. And even if I have managed to put most of it together in one slide, we still don't have a, a, as clear a, a handle on uh, how exactly the uh, galaxy environment, uh, well, high density cluster environment affect galaxies. So instead of going with like the different classical plots showing different uh, a galaxy property versus some measure of environment, I have tried to list here uh, summarize what we can observe. So the, one of the first things that we have observed since a while is quenching of star formation and uh, redder galaxy colors. So it is why it is now widely accepted that galaxy, uh, galaxies, spiral galaxies, when they are in high density environment, their star formation gets shut down. We still do not have consensus on the precise processes that lead to this shutting down of star formation, but we have observed this much. And we also see that galaxies have considerably redder colors in high density environments. Then there is the classic morphology density relation where we uh, find that galaxies with early type physical morphologies are most commonly found in the highest density region of the clusters. So if we have to summarize it in uh, a nutshell, then we would find elliptical galaxies in the cluster cores, whereas spiral galaxies or late-type galaxies will be more commonly found in the cluster outskirts. We also find that galaxies in clusters have reduced um, atomic hydrogen content, uh, hydrogen gas content, and this is one of the processes that we feel uh, leads to the shutting down of star formation because the gas is removed from the galaxies due to some physical process. Galaxy sizes, now this is a question mark. I, I worked on this as well in intermediate redshift clusters. Uh, there, have been, uh, there have been a lot of contradictory studies that the galaxies and clusters are bigger than in field or they are smaller than in field, which is why I have given a question mark and the uh, references are, uh, are the studies who support either of this. And uh, then, uh, well, I really won't go much into galaxy metallicity and suppress agent activity primarily because I have not directly worked in it, so I don't want to give out wrong interpretive uh, results. But this is kind of like the summary that I would like to leave here uh, with some of the references. But this is just a few of the references. The actual list is exhaustive. And another important observation that we found, which is relevant to what I will be presenting, is delayed transformation in galaxy morphology post quenching So there have been studies that are showing uh, the insert, higher incidence of transitionary galaxy population. For example, uh, redder or passive spirals in galaxy clusters. And it is one of those observations that are telling us that maybe the galaxies quench first and then they transform later. And this is also related to the morphology density relation because we feel that the Late type galaxies undergo morphological transformation to early type disk galaxies and then become completely passive and red and dead. Okay, so what could lead to the quenching of star formation and what are the possible processes? Now, I'm pretty sure all of you must be knowing this slide. I think Jacob was touching it many times. But this is one of the um, uh, illustrations that I absolutely love to explain in a nutshell what processes a galaxy undergo in high density environment. Uh, so 
each of these processes result in the removal or uh, uh, in a way affecting the gas content in the galaxies and whenever you affect the gas content in a star forming galaxy you affect its star formation but there are several processes like um, uh, harassment which is basically uh, an interaction between uh, galaxy and galaxy high speed interaction that can disrupt the gas uh, then you have tidal truncation where the gas from the disk is uh, removed. But the most uh, uh, effective way that that is most supported right now is uh, ramp pressure stripping, where the cold gas from the galaxy uh, disk is completely removed. And this is because of the pressure exerted by the high density ICM as the galaxy moves through the cluster. Um, and starvation is basically you are devolving uh, a fresh, well, I don't know how to say it, but you're devolving the uh, galaxy with new fuel, new gas to let it continue um, or start star formation. And all these processes are effective at different regions of the clusters. So this is another uh, uh, plot from Schumer Dahl where uh, it summarizes at what uh, at what region of the cluster which process is more uh, likely to affect the galaxies. Sorry, can you yeah. say something about harassment? Is it gravitational interaction with the cluster? I'm sorry, I, I, <laughs> I think well, from what I understand, harassment is I mean, yeah. gravitational interaction with okay. other galaxies. It's just the gravitation. Yeah. Right. So, all this while we have talked about clusters and uh, effect of high density environment and galaxies. But what happens when your host cluster starts to change over a long period of time? But this is bound to happen because obviously smaller structures fall together to form bigger structures. And that's how we have the hugest structures here. So, uh, this is uh, so this is kind of like uh, a, an example of what an evolving environment looks like. So we have like these little square. This is a field of other 901, uh, 902 supercluster. So this supercluster has several component galaxy clusters coming together to form a gravitationally huge system. So all this while, all the uh, results that I showed before could be thought of the effects that we see in those little squares that I'm showing. But what happens when this system comes together? How will it affect the galaxies? So that is something that is not completely uh, constrained. There have been studies, not a lot of studies, but people are now looking into the effect of uh, large scale structure and the effect of evolving large scale environment on galaxies. So, uh, like I mentioned in the uh, like I mentioned in the very first slide, that finding a truly relaxed cluster is a rarity, and this kind this mosaic kind of explains why. Uh, so, what I've uh, what I'm showing here is basically the X-ray emission from clusters. Uh, X-ray emission is mostly uh, arising due to the hot ICM in uh, galaxy clusters. So because of the high density, the ICM is... is that is the one, galaxy, it's only right? just close it. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> okay, I don't understand Spanish that much. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so the ICM, the intracluster medium gets heated up because of high density and that gives rise to the extinction. So, in a relaxed cluster, a, well, uh, a cluster which does not have any kind of dynamical activity in it, the X-ray emission will be very uniform. Something that will be from the central regions of the cluster outside with a uniform profile. But as you can see here, clusters really have that kind of uniform profile, which means that there's a lot of activity going on on a cluster scale. So uh, these are, the images or examples from the WINGS survey. 
and these are i guess the chandra and xmm wherever possible uh, the images and this also brings us to how do we if we if the majority of the clusters are not relaxed or not we are not i will say we realize we realize but are dynamically having a lot of activity how do we interpret the structure of the cluster so whenever we have to study about galaxy properties you and you have to uh, link it with the uh, uh, cluster environment either in the form of say cluster centric gradients local density or general cluster field bifurcation so this kind of poses a big problem is that for example if we are going to look at any galaxy property as a function of cluster centric gradients how do we define the center of a cluster if a cluster is not relaxed like the pretty image that i showed in the beginning how do we do that and second is what we call as the cluster phase space which is basically interpreting a cluster a, a, on a space of cluster centric radius and the line of sight velocities and one gives the information of the of the orbital evolution of the galaxy population and the other gives the information about the location of the galaxies in the galaxy cluster so from the previous uh, mosaic uh coming to post processing or coming to the uh, how galaxies are affected in evolving environments one of the most extreme uh, form of uh, uh, evol evolving environment is major cluster mergers so basically just like a galaxy galaxy merger you have major cluster mergers where uh, two clusters two or three and i should not be normalizing to two of equal mass merge together to form one big cluster which is pretty much how galaxy clusters grow over time but this merging process is extremely violent and it's one of the well, most explosive uh, uh, processes that we can see in the universe and these uh, cluster mergers are more common in higher redshift because by the time you come to lower redshift systems have already grown a lot bigger um, there are several ways of uh, detecting these cluster mergers x-ray uh, cluster emission like i showed before is one of them the other most important is the presence of shocks the presence of shock front so this shock front is uh, the uh, the shocks that arise as soon as the pericentric passage happens between uh, major merger and this shock is basically just the density waves uh, propagating through the dense icm and this shock is observable in multi wavelength in x-ray as clear shock fronts and in diffuse cluster radio emission as radio relics so here are two examples that i have uh, shown so the the right one is the uh, left one sorry <laughs> the left one is an example of merging cluster uh able to some four four and what you can see here is in the pink are basically the uh radio relics which show, which indicate the periphery of the shock when you are observing the relic so just radio relics or diffuse radio emission is some is uh, uh, is the radiation that arises due to synchrotron processes in the uh, cluster ic <laughs> um we also have other diffuse uh, emission which could indicate the dynamical history like radio halos uh radio mini halos but one key thing about radio relics is that their lifetime is relatively short in the sense that if it is a younger major merger you have a higher chance of observing the shock front as a radio relic so up to about i think one or two giga years so that kind of gives you the age when the merger actually happened and this is one of the key important points uh, or key properties that we can use to determine how galaxies within these systems when they are merging get affected okay so coming back to the cumulative environment uh, slide that i uh, showed a while back 
this is kind of like the, my the motivation behind the uh, work that I have done. Uh, post processing due to evolving cluster environment, majorly through major cluster mergers. So there are three uh, three areas that we have looked into. One is uh, understanding and quantifying dynamical states of clusters, looking at ram pressure stripping fractions. Uh, then we did a pilot study with a very well-known um, major merger called Ava 3376. It was one of the first uh, cluster uh, discovered with asymmetric radio relics, so asymmetric shock front. And dynamically, it's a very, well, what I like to call as the perfect merger because it, it's, a, it's a major merger. It's, uh, it's a merger that happened in the plane of the sky. So we see a different view, even though we lose out on the line of sight velocity information because of it. And it is also a headlong merger where the impact parameter is very less. So literally the two clusters went to each other completely. And then the next, uh, the, uh, the third part of this is looking at star formation history. So because we know that star formation gets affected in high density environments, and we know that we are working with a evolving environment, the only way of putting a timestamp on any kind of changes in star formation is to look at how the star formation changed as the cluster dynamical state is changing which is why star formation history is uh, the thing that we are looking into. And the last part is something that, um, that is still in progress, and it is one of the reasons why I'm here to work with Jacopo uh, so that we, uh, we can continue and uh, look into detail. Okay, so from here, the, this is uh, all about uh, results. And uh, I'll be presenting the results in uh, uh, basically just like a summary to give you an idea of what, what we are understanding, what we have looked into. So in, please interrupt me if you have any questions regarding any technical details or you can come and talk to me later. So as I, as I showed before, the variety in the dynamical states of the clusters if we are working with a sample of galaxy clusters and we want to look at galaxies within them, how are, how are we going to get a handle on the dynamical state? Are we going to look at each and every cluster by eye, look at the X-ray emission and then see whether it's relaxed or it's not relaxed, it's undergoing merger, etc. So this is one of the motivation behind uh, one of, uh, so Anna Lorenzo, she's a PhD student at IFA Uwe. Uh, one of the reasons why she decided to look into quantifying the dynamical states of galaxy clusters. So in literature, there are a lot of studies that have done that have looked into the X-ray emission, measure the concentration, measure the asymmetries in the X-rays, or measure the uh, quantified the distribution of galaxies, for example, through substructure analysis to, to basically quantify the dynamical state of clusters. So uh, what she did, she looked at, uh, she used several X-ray and optical uh, proxies or signatures to uh, look in uh, to look at clusters from the wing survey. So wing survey has a total of seventy two clusters. She looked at clusters which are complete till 0.7 R two hundred. And what we what we did is uh, using uh, X-ray peak the X-ray emission in the clusters and using uh, the location of the BCGs as an optical signature, we looked at how we can uh, come up with a classification scheme to identify and classify galaxy clusters based on what stage of interaction they are in. And uh, this is kind of like a very detailed flowchart uh, where we look at the location of X-ray peak, questions like whether the BCG coincides with the X-ray peak, uh, then whether uh, the emission is concentrated, homogeneous, or whether it is asymmetric. And through a lot of uh, flowchart questions, we are able to 
significantly identify galaxy clusters as relaxed uh, or, or relaxed with a bit of substructure, uh, interacting clusters. So basically clusters with an interacting group or a group that is uh, flowing nearby or filaments. Uh, then we have pre virgin clusters where we, have, we are observing clusters which are on their way towards a major merger but have not yet. And then we have the post-merger systems. But this is still a qualitative exercise. What if you want to quantify with a number? If we have to say using two proxies or two indicators, whether if looking at that number, whether a cluster is dynamically relaxed or not. So through her analysis, she found that, um, yeah, she found that the cluster concentration and asymmetry in X-ray and the magnitude gap between the first and the second reddish galaxy uh, and the fraction of substructure are found to be best correlated to separate out the relaxed from the uh, unrelaxed uh, or disturbed galaxy clusters. So next, well, well this uh, one of her uh, one of her PhD. Uh, uh, work focus is to look at ramp pressure stripping and ramp pressure stripping in wider galaxy environments. So uh, what she looked at was also the ramp pressure strip fraction of galaxies in each of uh, each of these clusters and to see whether there is a dependence on the dynamical state of the clusters. Uh, surprisingly we found that there is no clear correlation but if we go back to the qualitative uh, classification that we did, we find a hint that clusters which are interacting, not major mergers, but group interaction or infalling substructure seem to show a higher fraction of ramp pressure galaxies. But this is also something that we need to be careful because if you look at this plot, the number of clusters which are strongly interacting are not a lot wherever you see the same. So basically one thing this is telling us is that ramp pressure strip galaxies have different evolution pathways, which is why we are not able to see uh, any signal in as a function of the dynamic state. And as I go ahead in the results, this is pretty much the biggest challenge that we have whenever we are looking at any galaxy property as a function of its dynamic state. Because everywhere we have to remove the average net signal of the cluster effect on the galaxy properties before this dynamical activity happens. And there is no easy way of doing it. So, second, so this is uh, the work, this is kind of the pilot study that I started with. And the question that I was interested in answering is that whether galaxy clusters, whether ma major merger, major cluster mergers, especially the ones that show uh, shock run, so that means a very young major merger, does it affect star formation in the member galaxies? And one of the uh, uh, one of the observed uh, not observed, but one of the confusing part is that there are very minimal studies that have been done. So, like I mentioned before. Major cluster mergers are more common at higher redshift. In that, they are also, uh, I won't say least observed, but uh, they are basically rare systems. So we don't have a good big sample of major cluster mergers to work with. Uh, so far, whatever studies have been done are done uh, looking at individual clusters and looking at galaxies, looking at emission line galaxies or star formation galaxies uh, near the shock fronts. So for example, here uh, on the left hand side is the sausage cluster which uh, underwent a major merger about a week a year back and there are studies that have found that there are star forming galaxies right at the shock front. Whereas there are several other uh, studies that have shown that there is no change in the star formation or in fact there are galaxies that are higher incidence of passive galaxies. So based on just three or four systems at higher redshift with individual analysis, we cannot really say much about 
what happens to galaxy populations as a whole because of these major merging events. Oh, I'm going to use a space now. Um, so this is this is why I decided to look at uh, this uh, LL3 to 76, the perfect merging, like I mentioned before. Um, and I got it as a pilot study because this was really the first uh, analysis uh, in the plan of looking at similar systems selected uniformly to look at the galaxy properties and star formation properties. So uh, uh, I think I, I mentioned uh, a bit about the merger geometry of 3376, but uh, just to give you an idea, this is one of the cluster from the wings uh, survey. Uh, so this is a part of Anna's work, which I showed before with the ramp pressure strip fractions and dynamical stage analysis. Um, and it underwent a major merger about 0.6 giga years. So it's very new. It's, it's very young in a way. And this, uh, the graph, the illustration kind of shows uh, a generalized uh, view of how a plane of the sky major merger looks. So we have a gas which gets disrupted. The galaxies within these clusters also get disturbed. It says their distribution differs. Even though surprisingly the morphology density relation is still conserved in the sense that we still get early type galaxies along the axis of the merger and the late type galaxies along the periphery. And then to define a post-merger environment, which is different than the classical way of defining galaxy cluster environment, I decided to look into concentric regions uh, uh, in the steps of 0.51 megaparsec from the center of the system. But be careful that when I'm talking about center of the system here, it's really the center between the two BCGs, between the two crosses. Because this is a system that is still in merging process. It has underwent merger and it is still going towards the set, the maximum distance. So it's still traveling away. So the galaxy distribution is stretched, which is why the center of the system we decided to look take as the midpoint of the position of the BCGs along the axis. And why concentric regions? Because if we have to look at the effect of merger shock on galaxy properties, we can generalize the merger shock to be expanding uniformly since the time of the merger. So basically, even if you're not observing the shock front, you can expect the shock front to be uniformly spreading out in a sphere. So uh, we used, uh, so, this one other thing with uh, working with these cluster mergers is because they are major interactions, spatially they are huge. So we need to have a lot of spatial coverage to look at galaxy properties. Right? So we look at the, uh, we, we use the data from Omega Wings, which is basically an extension of the wings, but covering uh, 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 cluster outscores, way so beyond 100. And uh, we used uh, spectroscopically confirmed networks for this study. Uh, now, because I am looking at a very specific type of galaxy environment uh, or, or, or dynamic cluster environment, it is very important that I have a sample of controlled relaxed clusters. So basically, clusters which do not have any of these complications. So through visual inspection of the X-ray maps, um, I, 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 I selected four galaxy clusters, which, which I put them compared to 3376. So, what we found out is that there are twofold environmental effects at play. One, which is the effect of environment before the major merger happened, one six figure is back, and the other is because of the merger. So, the pre-merger environment is found through the uh, presence of passive red spirals, which are already on the red spirals. And they are massive, so most likely they were already on their way towards quenching, and the morphologies have not yet changed, and they are already there on the cluster red sequence uh, since before the merger happened. So for 
I mean, for people who don't know about uh, that sequence, uh, if you look at the galaxy colors and the magnitudes, and uh, you look at the you look at the space uh, for the cluster members, you find that you have a very tight sequence of red galaxies, which is how you which is how we can even find new galaxy clusters or young galaxy clusters. But what is also occurring is that we also count uh, high mass spirals which have significantly bluer colors. And if I look at these spirals of where they are in this big system as a function of the concentric uh, expanding shock front, I find that these are the spirals that are lying exactly in the center along the axis of the merger. But their stellar masses and their colors show that even if being in such a hot ICM environment, in a post-merger environment, they are not quenched. They are still forming stars. Even if I'm not finding any signatures of enhanced star formation, at least something keeps the star formation going. And this is, uh, this is evident even if I look at the star formation main sequence. So if I look at the star formation rate versus stellar mass, they are definitely on the star forming main sequence. Well, I wouldn't say they are definitely on the star forming main sequence. They are pretty much in a similar to a spiral galaxy in a relaxed cluster environment. So basically they are indistinguishable despite being in such different and such volatile environment. And then we also looked at post harvest galaxies. And the reason for looking at post harvest galaxies is because these are the galaxies that really help you give a timestamp on the stellar properties. Galaxies which are observed post harvest now are basically those galaxies which had an episode of, well, I wouldn't say extreme, but some form of starburst about half to one gigawatt back. Now this timeline fits in perfectly with the timeline of when the mergers happened. So if we want to think about if the activity of the merging is affecting star formation, then it would make sense for us to look at post harvest galaxies and link it to the time scale or the merger history of the cluster. So what we found out is that we have distinct population of post harvest galaxies on the color magnitude relation, which means that post harvest galaxies have different formation times and likely the processes through which they became post harvest are different. And we also find a higher incidence of low mass late type post harvest galaxies. So one of the things that we feel is happening is that somehow maybe because of the merger, low mass spiral galaxies are observed as post harvest galaxies right now because of some sort of a starburst episode that occurred at the onset of the merger when the uh, pericentric passage of the two clusters actually happened. And this is also something that was shown in simulations by Becky 2010, where they found that major cluster mergers can lead to starburst in galaxies that are actually caught in the axis or in the direction of the merger. But again, like I said, this is just one cluster. If we have to talk about galaxy properties and the general uh, effect of these volatile environments, we really, really need to expand the sample, look at more cluster mergers, and then talk about the galaxy and star formation. So this is kind of like the last part before I wrap up. And it's a work in progress. So uh, these are like really, really fairly new results. And um, what we are looking at now is in the wings and omega wing sample through Anna studies, through my pilot study, we have expanded our sample to include three merging clusters, which I have shown in red on this plot. So this plot basically just shows the uh, velocity dispersion of clusters and the cluster redshift. The clusters mentioned in black are basically the extended control cluster sample. So two things. First, our merging cluster sample now includes two more clusters, which even they, they differ in their global cluster properties, 
For example, Apple 168 is the least massive major merger that has ever been discovered through low frequency uh, radio detections. And Apple 3667 is one of the massive clusters. I think it is the most massive cluster in the wind survey. But one thing that is common to all three clusters is that their merger occurred at pretty much the same time scale, plus or minus between 0.5 giga years and 1 giga year. So here, now we are able to constrain on the dynamical time scale of the major merging activity. We also extended the control sample now to include more galaxies uh, after taking into account Anna's analysis. So we now have from four, we now have eight relaxed clusters, uh, which gives us a really good handle on the statistics when we are comparing between galaxy populations and merging clusters versus control clusters. We have also improved magnitudes with improved A corrections. Uh, in my previous work, whenever I was talking about the color magnitude relation and the red spirals and the blue PSPs, I was using an average red sequence fit from the wings survey. But because, because clusters vary in, uh, in cluster masses and several other things, uh, we, we thought it would be best to use individual red sequence fittings for each and every cluster. And that is one thing that we have decided to use now, now that we have a more uniform sample. So we, we fitted, uh, we looked into red sequence fitting for each and every merging cluster as well as each and every control cluster. We also have uh, improved uh, star formation history from Synopsys, which is a spectrophotometric modeling board. Uh, any more technical questions? We have an expert here, Jacobo Boksai. And this is this is what I, I am working on here while here during my time at Puna. So we I have taken uh, the new new fit results uh, and data products from Synopsis from David's work, which he has submitted. Um, and that basically will uh, give us a handle on the star formation history of the uh, galaxies as well as the star formation rates. So this is kind of just like the teaser uh, result thing because uh, this, this was one of the results that was ready to be presented. So uh, I have, can I point here? I have to point here. Yes. Yeah. No, point, point with the complete box. Okay, fine. So in my pilot study, this was the cluster that I observed, which is the cluster where I found that you have significant population of red passive spirals as well as you have blue post starburst galaxies you also have higher mass blue spirals but now when i'm looking at other clusters with different cluster properties i find that the most massive cluster merger has very high fraction of red spirals as compared to relaxed clusters and complementary, we also find that the least massive merging cluster has a higher fraction or is as a higher fraction of blue lenticular galaxies. So I won't go into much details because this is like very new result that we are still discussing and chewing on what exactly it means. But what we can be sure that it's it's telling us is that. Cluster mergers, major cluster mergers are somehow accelerating galaxy rotation. And now the biggest challenge that we have, we, which we are trying to resolve, is how do we separate out the signal from the effect or the base effect of the cluster environment before the major merger happens. And this is one of the key results. And another interesting thing is that all these outlier uh, galaxy uh, sample, the the red uh, the red spirals in three six six seven and the blue lenticulars in one six eight, they are majorly consist uh, they majorly comprised of post August galaxies. So now what we are 
kind of uh, looking into is really focusing on those starless galaxies, focusing on their star formation history and linking it with the dynamical history of the clusters. And yeah, this is this is where I would like to uh, leave you with my results. But more than results, it's really a summary of what we have learned and how complicated the situation is and what we have to really, really take into consideration. For example, galaxy cluster environment is a continuous spectrum. There is no mergers and relaxed or there is no cluster and field. So it really depends how and when you're observing your galaxies at what stage. Signatures of pre and post processing are observable. Disentangling them is the biggest challenge. And just looking at one cluster is not enough. And this is the, the results that I presented. This is the first survey of galaxy population in merging clusters that has been conducted, where both the merging and the non-merging clusters are selected in the uniform way using the same uh, data, using the same spectroscopic and photometric data within the same redshift range, which is very important because it's not common to find such major mergers with radio relics at low redshift. But we have a sample of three clusters. And yeah, stay tuned for more, more and more results. And thank you. Thanks very much, Shitija. Okay, do we have questions in the auditorium? Yeah. I just want to ask if we have questions. You. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I want to know about the properties of the, the spectral properties of the X-ray emitting gas. Is it soft X-ray emission? Do you detect lines? Uh, or is the temperature? Are we, are we asking generally? Yes. Yeah. The are they the, the same uh, properties of the X-ray emission gas in all these clusters? Uh, Do well, we have if you ask me about the soft and hard X-ray emission, I am not sure I looked into that much in future detail because I have never done uh, X-ray modeling. But it's thermal. Yes. That, 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 that's all I know. Uh, with, with a KI or line, yeah. uh, and uh, depend, the temperature can vary between. Because if you, if you have the peak, my, my question goes in this sense that because if you're comparing the peak of the X-ray mission with the peak of the massive uh, galaxy, it could be because of the black hole activity and not because um, of the extended emission. Yeah, yeah. So you have to. Uh, that's. Yeah, okay, yeah. So the cluster X ray emission is thermal. And it's, it's actually a lot more uh, evident if it is disturbed. Because then you have a lot of, uh, well, I don't know whether you can call it substructure, but a lot of uh, definition in the thermal X ray emission. That's, that's one of the ways of finding. Uh, mergers. My point is because you select the peak, it's one arc second, which is Chandra resolution. It's, it's, right? Yeah. So uh, when so when we are modeling the uh, X-ray thermal X-ray emission in the clusters, and especially if you want to get the temperature, the temperature profile, you also want to get a handle on the age uh, of the emission. Then you remove possible uh, contamination or these X-ray source from the central PCG. Mm -hmm. I, I have never done that, but I know that's how it's done. The temperature of the gap depends on the mass of the But, it's, Probably, yes, yeah. but is it like an order of magnitude, like from a million to 10 million? Or is 10 million to 100? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's 10 to the 7 to the 8. Now, I, I'm curious about how the spectrum of a normal spiral is different from the spectrum of a post-starburst spiral. Well, uh, in post-starburst spectra, in the spectrum of how the galaxy is, you see a lot of balance absorption lines. Yeah, that's why I was asking, because normal spirals have a lot of balance. I think it's the height, it's, uh, it's the equivalent width and the height of the absorption that matters. In a normal spiral, you would observe emission lines. Yeah, not strong emissions. Yeah, I've seen spectral spirals and they have a 
losses. But that's why I was curious about it because an elliptical, to me, an elliptical is clear. No, a yes. starburst elliptical has Barnard absorption lines. But the normal spiral has a lot of Barnard absorption lines. So, well, how do you. So, a uh, uh, starburst normally is defined spectroscopically as a galaxy which has a spectrum with a, an H delta in absorption with a little bit larger than 4 angstrom. Yeah, beautiful. So, that, that's where you see the predominance of uh, uh, A stars, A plus uh, stars. So, which means that about uh, 500 uh, million years ago, there was an episode of star formation which was suddenly quenched, and what is left is uh, these A stars that are now main sequence that you can see because no other star formation happened. And these many A stars that were formed in the past, you now can see through the absorption lines. But I, I suspect that this would still be a bit different if you're looking at the disk spectra versus the central regions. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. But so it, it can be an elliptical, it can be whatever galaxy or a, a spiral. The post starburst is defined with the, by the presence of a, a large population of A stars that you can identify from absorption value After a certain time. After a certain time. Thank you. So it may happen that, so one thing that we have not looked here is the strength of the post starburst galaxies. So we have just classified the galaxies as post starburst galaxies, but whether they show strong Balmer absorption or weak or what, we have we have not done that. And can we watch a couple of the beginning spectra? Because a spiral has continuous star yes. formation. So you are going to have a normal spiral, right? if that exists. You will have the Balmer lines yes, on the yes, one that form, that, that and then true. you also have the... That is true. But because it is continuous star formation, you don't see uh, this strong absorption yeah. because you have the... Uh, contribution from other stars which have less uh, uh, less absorption or less intense absorption. So the the uh, <coughs> the amount of absorption that we would observe now in post starburst galaxy could only arise if there was a starburst more than the continuous star formation in the galaxy. More questions? From here, uh, uh, online. Do we have any questions on the Zoom? Looks like uh, no. Okay. Then it's all. Thanks. <laughs>